Hello and welcome to this video on Humankind's Classical Era Wonders. This is the second part in a five-part series looking at the different wonders across the ages that we've had access to in the closed beta. In this particular video, like I mentioned, we will be looking at the Classical Era Wonders including the Colossus of Rhodes, Mausoleum at Halicarnassus, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, and the Statue of Zeus. So, that in mind, the topics we'll be covering, and I went into this in some detail in my first video, but just as a reminder, we'll look at the unique effects of each wonder, including the both the immediate effects and the scaling effects, so how useful is the wonder when you get it, and how useful is the wonder later in the game, what affinity or playstyle synergies the wonder has, what cultural synergies the wonder has, and how does this combine with other cultures? And this isn't to say that any of these uh, sort of affinities or synergies are the best in every situation, but these are going to be the ones that, in my opinion, are generally the best combination with the wonders, even if it's not true in every single situation. As a reminder as well, every wonder provides plus 20 stability and plus 100 fame when you build it, so we're not going to talk about that for each individual wonder unless it combines really well with some other thing that they provide, in which case we'll discuss it. And additionally, you'll see these different symbols that I use to represent each affinity. They should be familiar to you if you're already familiar with the game. The one that is perhaps a little unfamiliar is I am using something to represent religion. Um, and in this case, it is the uh, holy site sort of symbol. Just because although religion is not really a affinity, an affinity, it is something that can have a pretty significant impact on your game. And some people are going to pursue uh, a religious strategy to supplement their game more than other people are going to. And I think it can be a viable strategy based on what we've seen so far, even after the significant nerfs to religion in the uh, coming from the open devs going into the closed beta. So we'll talk about religious game as well, uh, and including the other affinities. So let's get started with our first wonder of the classical, which is the Colossus of Rhodes. <laughs> the Colossus of Rhodes is not going to start us off very strong. The only effect of the Colossus of Rhodes is that militia are not lost over time during sieges. Yeah, that's it. So, this, I mean, this doesn't really have any particularly strong effects. This doesn't really combine well with any particular affinity. There aren't any particular cultures that make strong use of this. And this is only useful when you're getting starved out, which is like never. It almost never happens. So I'm thinking that maybe this can see a little bit of use in multiplayer, potentially because players are going to be more likely to take advantage of starving someone out, I suspect. But at, at the same time, it's so much more efficient to just have a big enough army to attack someone and take their city immediately. And it's really not that hard to get an army that can just overrun militia. So I, I just I don't see really a use for the Colossus of Rhodes. Potentially, if you're going against someone like the Huns or the Mongols, and you have a city where it's too deep for their hordes to attack into. But even then, like particularly the Huns, you can get up to the Huns so fast that there's no possible way that you have the Colossus of Rhodes by the time the Huns show up. So I just... I'm very down on this. Honestly, I think the Colossus is probably the worst wonder in the game. Um, if you want to get the Colossus, unless you have a very, very, very specific strategy in mind and how it is going to be useful to you, I would recommend choosing literally any other wonder, and it's going to be more useful. And it doesn't really have any synergies with other wonders. Um, it's just it's just that bad. It doesn't provide you 
any real outputs or anything. It's just what it provides is just not useful. So let's talk about our first actually useful wonder in the classical era, which is the Lighthouse of Alexandria. So the Lighthouse provides uh, basically some vision on all your units, which is use, always useful uh, in order to determine where your enemy is positioned, how you should attack or defend, how to position your own units, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it provides you a little bit of extra intelligence, and intelligence sometimes is what really makes or breaks a war effort. So getting a little more intel about where your enemies are, where their cities are, all that kind of stuff is nice, but it's not really the primary reason you build this. It's just kind of a secondary effect. Really what you're here for is the plus one combat strength and plus two movement speed on naval embarked units. If you've watched my tier lists for the different eras for the cultures in those eras you know that i am not a big fan of naval units and i think most people aren't it's a common problem in 4x games where the navy is just not as useful what makes the lighthouse of alexandria good are those situations in which you actually want to be having naval units so if you are on an island or an archipelago, or very small continents, and you're going to be need you need to cross water in order to get to an enemy, in order to expand your empire. The lighthouse of Alexandria becomes much better, and that, in fact, it probably becomes a top tier wonder in one of those situations because the plus one combat strength and extra movement speed is going to give you a major military advantage over some of your opponents. So let's talk very quickly about the playstyles this works with. And really, it's militarist and expansionist. The militarist is obvious. And the, the flat CS bonus to your units and some movement speed, you know, you are most of the time going to be in control of the water. And because water units can move so fast and the size of the ocean, it means you can really intercept enemies before they're ever even going to be able to threaten your cities. Having control of the ocean means having control of the supply lines between the two pieces of land that people are trying to travel between. So when you have your own little island and the enemy has their own little island and whatever it is, they can't threaten your city if you have a stronger navy. And then the militarists can turn around, they can use that navy as fire supports for their invading land units that they hopefully have more of being a militarist anyway so very good for militarists in those situations where uh, there's a lot of water and you really need to be maintaining a larger navy and i don't mean militarist just as in militarist affinity the militarists like any of the other cultures i'll be mentioning here can be anyone that has some kind of advantage to their military play that they are actively pursuing so this could be someone like uh, one of the cultures I'll, I'll mention later here, the Joseon, who have their turtle ship as their emblematic unit, that is very, very strong on the water, and they can use it to bolster themselves as a militarist culture in certain situations. So it's not just militarists that will benefit th from this, but anyone that can pursue that military play style on the water. The other are expansionist sort of cultures, and expansionists are a little bit different they get the same benefits because they still want to be conquering territory much like the militarists but the difference is is that an expansionist play style can also mean you're going out and discovering new lands to settle rather than conquer and the lighthouse of alexandria is going to in some situations enable you to get to land masses that other players can't get to yet or get to them faster so if you recall penalties in deep water, your units will start to deteriorate if they're in deep water for too long. There are some situations where that extra movement speed means you can get to shallow water. And with the extra vision, you're going to know where the shallow water is. So this means you can really go exploring without taking that much risk of losing your units and discover new land masses where you can settle more cities. 
So cultures, the first and most obvious synergy is going to be the Norsemen, right? Because the Norsemen already get bonuses to their uh, to their naval units, and they get access to a longship, which is the first unit that can actually explore across oceans. I mean, this thing is basically built for the Norse, because the Norse are going to be looking to travel across the ocean, maybe settle some cities, use their longship and their bonuses in order to go raid other unsuspecting players where they can make a lot of money if they built some Nos. So Lighthouse of Alexandria, really good with the Norsemen. Another are the Dutch, and this is largely because of the Fluet, their emblematic unit, which is really a unit transport. So the Fluet has a higher base movement than the, its counterparts in the pre-modern era, and it gets additional movement when you're starting in your own territory. So what this enables you to do is really ferry units and navies, if you need them, really, really quickly between coastal areas. So suddenly for the Dutch, this becomes a way to perhaps fight a two-front war where you're being compressed on both sides. You can move your military very quickly via the coast down to defend one city, and within a turn or two, they can be back up at your other border. So the Dutch will also benefit from this because with the fluid, it means you can go explore new land masses and you get even additional naval speed when you're doing that. So you can get to the new world or an island or whatever faster than other people can. Next are the Joseon, and this is largely because of their uh, turtle ship that I forget the actual name of, but in the West, at least, we often refer to them as turtle ships. So the turtle ships are this, you know, pretty damn good pre-modern naval units. Um, quite powerful, really, and they get some combat strength bonuses if they are directly adjacent to their enemies. And the extra naval movement speed means that the turtle ship is going to be more likely to be able to take advantage of those kind of scenarios, to be able to move up directly adjacent to enemy ships. And they're already getting that extra combat strength when they do that innately, and the extra plus one combat strength that you're getting from the lighthouse. So really good combination with the turtle ships. And this might be the only time you'll see the Venetians here, but the Venetians work well with this in the situations that the Gallius is really good. Because the Gallius gets plus 11 combat strength when it's in coastal waters, so that puts it up to something like 50 combat strength in the, in the pre-modern, which is insane. And then you'd stack the lighthouse on top of it for an extra one combat strength and another two movement speed and some more vision, it's just nuts. Like, if you're the Venetians on a water-based map, no one is going to be able to touch you. And you can use the Gallius as a gun platform to assault enemy cities as well. And most likely, they're going to be near coastline. So the Venetians combine really well with the Lighthouse of Alexandria in, again, those situations where there's a water-heavy map. And it's going to be the only situation, I suspect, that you ever see the Venetians in. But in those situations, they'll work pretty well with the lighthouse. So really, as I've mentioned, the general strategy here, you want to build the lighthouse when you are making a really heavy investment in sort of water-based combat and exploration. There is a little bit of use for that extra vision on land units. But I would really consider that more of a rider effect and not the main effect you're building the lighthouse for. If this is like the only wonder left in the game other than the Colossus, you're still going to pick the lighthouse every single time. Um, but if you're not utilizing naval units very much, or at least don't anticipate utilizing them, it, it may still be worth passing over the lighthouse uh, just to pick up a different wonder in the in the next era. So it does have a couple wonder synergies, and these aren't going to be as strong as some of the other wonders. The first is the Forbidden City, which gives you uh, an extra, I believe, plus 25 war support whenever you go to war. 
Obviously, the Lighthouse of Alexandria is a bit of a more aggressive wonder, enabling you to go on the offense when you're at sea with your extra movement and combat strength. So someone like the Norsemen are really going to benefit from that kind of combination. They can be going to war more often to make use of the benefits that the Lighthouse provides. The other is the Temple of Artemis. And again, this is a bit of a weaker synergy than some of the other wonders. But the Temple of Artemis does provide additional healing to all your units. So after you've gone into combat with your navy and perhaps taken over a city with your army, it means you can heal up a little bit more quickly so you can continue to push into enemy territory. So next we have the Mausoleum at Halicarnassus, or Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. I've usually referred to it as the latter, I believe. But the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus gives you a very simple but powerful effect, which is plus 1% science per district. Uh, this is per district in the city that you build it, not uh, per district across your empire, because that would be crazy. So plus 1% science per district. This has two very, very obvious uh, sort of play style affinities. First will be the builders, right? And the logic here is pretty simple. More districts is more science. Obviously, with the mausoleum, the more districts you build, the larger percent bonus to your science you're going to be getting. And with builders in particular, if you have a given city that is largely focusing on science output, say you have a city that has specialized in producing research quarters, you can put down the mausoleum there for maximum effect because you're a builder that has the capability of building more districts typically and you can activate your builder mode to convert all the science you're generating to get out some more districts and because you have a lot of research quarters you're boosting the amount of science you get more than you would in other cities um, so Mausoleum, uh, pretty good for builders just by nature of the fact that you are very likely to have more districts. The other are the scientists, obviously, because you want to double down on your science bonuses. You probably don't have as many districts as builders, but you do have a higher base science output, and it's not like you have no districts at all as a scientist. By the time the mausoleum comes around, you you're probably sitting at 10 to 15 districts, even if you haven't played a builder at all, um, on, on at least on your main cities. So you can still get a pretty sizable science benefit out of this. And for both cultures and for any, or both affinities and for any affinity, really, you're always going to be continuing to build districts throughout the game. So the percent science that you get from the mausoleum actually scales up as the game continues because you're getting more districts. And at least for one city, you'll actually get more benefit out of this than you get out of you know, the, the French legacy trait on, say, the capital or whatever city you build this on, or even perhaps more than the British get, depending on the state of the game. So the mausoleum is really powerful for people that are trying to pursue uh, a heavy science-based game. And honestly, the mausoleum is probably going to be the most competitive wonder in the classical era. It's going to be a wonder that everyone wants, regardless of the affinity. Because plus 1% science per district is a very powerful effect, and you don't see a lot of these per district or per pop effects showing up until much later in the game. The only one I can think of in this same era is the plus one food per pop from the Celts. And there's a reason for that, because they scale so well later that they're very uh, powerful. So they have to offset their power by making them appear later in the game. And the mausoleum just appears really, really early. This is a wonder that it is probably worth saving up influence for if you are trying to go for a quick advance from the ancient into the classical era so you can claim it right away. And particularly in multiplayer, I suspect it's going to be really difficult to get your hands on this thing. 
we'll see how science gets rebalanced at release, but at least in the closed beta, there were a lot of issues with people struggling to generate science unless they picked a lot of scientist cultures. And the mausoleum is something that allows you to help offset that disadvantage from not having picked scientists, particularly like the Joseon or the, um, or the French, I think were the, the two major ones. But even the Umayyads are a pretty significant science generating culture. So mausoleum allows you to pursue other avenues, perhaps, that you wouldn't have been able to pursue without it and allows you to keep up on the science game. So while you may have decided, you know, oh, I want to pick the Umayyads in the medieval era, now you can pick the Teutons instead, or whatever it is. So, honestly, the effect of this is so powerful. I would say this has the most synergies of any wonder in the game, potentially, but it's definitely, like, top three. Um, the first... The Egyptians, starting in the ancient era, the Egyptians, they get that minus 10% build cost on their quarters. Very good. Allows them to get out more quarters, and they have their production base to support it. The Zhou are a little bit different. They have plus 2 stability on their districts, so that means they can support larger cities, which means they have more districts. The British, if they are building this in their... If they had built this in their capital... They're getting bonus money and science based on the number of territories that they have on their capital, which also combines with the extra science per district that they'll be getting from the mausoleum. The Mayans are uh, the builder culture for the classical era, so they're a culture that actually appears in the era that you get it. And the Mayans are another builder culture. They have um, a lot of power and able to get out a lot of districts. And I think, importantly, the Mayans also sort of nudge you towards a taller play style with the Kuna, because the Kuna is generating production per number of territories in the city that you build it. And typically, when you have a lot of territories on a city, you're also going to build up that city with a lot of districts. You're kind of focusing your efforts into a smaller number of cities, which sort of gives the mausoleum a bit of a double effect, right? You're building districts more quickly, and you're more likely to have more of them. The next one are the Austro-Hungarians, and I would throw the Italians in here as well for the same reasons. Very similar to the Zhou, except they have the capacity to support much, much larger cities with either the Opern House for the Hungarians or the benefits you get to the Commons Quarters with the Italians. So the Austro-Hungarians and Italians both have this incredible ability to expand their cities like none other. So once the industrial era rolls around, if you have the mausoleum, you really want to get those stability bonuses in the city the mausoleum is so you can get even more districts. The French are another obvious one. They get a plus 20% flat bonus to their science output. And their exhibition hall gives them science per population. So they are just this insane science-generating culture. And that combines really well with the mausoleum. Even if you just have 20 districts, you're effectively in the city you have the mausoleum doubling the effect of your uh, legacy trait. But you likely have more than 20 districts in a city that, that is that old. Then you have the, the Mughals, and I, I, to a lesser extent, the, the Khmer. Uh, again, more builders that really have the capacity to generate a lot of districts, build out their cities. And the Joseon as well are another uh, good science culture that get a lot of benefits from being near the coast, can get a lot of science that way, uh, as well as the Sewan, which can generate you some additional science. So again, the mausoleum, although perhaps you won't have as many districts as some other cultures, you have a higher base science output, so you're still going to get just as much benefit as someone that's built a lot of districts. So really, the strategy here is simple. The more districts you have, the higher the modifier that you get from the mausoleum. You do need a combination of both science and districts when you build this. You can't just focus on one of those two things. If you build this in a city where you haven't built 
any of the science quarters. Well, sure, you may have a really big modifier if you have a big city, but you're not getting very much out of it because you don't have a very high science output. So you do need to balance those two things when you are deciding where to place this wonder, but most of the time you are going to have at least some measure of science output, and the mausoleum will probably push you towards increasing that a little bit more. So the mausoleum also has quite a few uh, synergies as, as far as wonders go. So the first is the pyramids, which gives you a 25% discount on, on your quarters, effectively. Um, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good synergy. So you get, plus, you get extra science per district that you build, and you have a discount to building those districts. Obvious. Uh, Stonehenge is one that is perhaps a little less obvious, and the reason for picking Stonehenge is because it is a wonder that lends itself to very large cities. It's an ancient era wonder that uh, provides you with a ton of stability. So the stability effects really let you build up a, an extra large city that can take advantage of that extra science that you're getting. The... Uh, Cathedral of Notre Dame, which I believe is just called Notre Dame in game, uh, is one that is perhaps a little obvious, but a little more niche. This is going to be one where if you're really focusing on a faith game, the uh, Notre Dame provides extra faith per research technologies. And with the mausoleum, you're going to be going through the tech tree faster than other comparable players, which means you're going to be generating more faith. So Notre Dame, Mausoleum, good combination if you are going for a faith-based game. Next is the uh, St. Basil's Cathedral, which provides plus one faith per district. And like Notre Dame acts as a holy site, so you get all those benefits as well. So uh, St. Basil's Cathedral, because you're going to have a lot of districts, as with the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, most likely you're going to want to expand your city more than some other people are going to. And St. Basil's Cathedral gives you faith per district rather than the faith per research technology that Notre Dame does. So again, if you're going for a faith-based game and you have the mausoleum, St. Basil's Cathedral is another wonder worth considering. Next we have Big Ben, and uh, Big Ben is an industrial era wonder, and Big Ben provides a plus 10% flat science and an additional plus 10% science per alliance that you have, and you get some more science on your capital if your empire is in an alliance. So... <laughs> Especially if you have the mausoleum located in your capital, and then you like combine it with the British, and then you combine it with Big Ben, man, you can get some insane science generation. So Big Ben and mausoleum is something to pick if you're really doubling down on your science output. And even if you're not in an alliance, that plus 10% science is still a decent benefit, but you may want to consider some other wonders instead um, if, you're, if you're not playing with any alliances, if you're going like full total war. Finally, there's also the Statue of Liberty, and the Statue of Liberty provides uh, money and science based on the number of territories in your sphere of influence. So the stronger of a cultural game you have, the more influence you're generating, the more territories are going to be in your sphere of influence, which means you'll generate more money and more science. And the Statue of Liberty provides those benefits empire-wide, which means it'll modify the already modified science output of whatever city contains the mausoleum. So if you have a stronger culture, you have a lot of territories under your sphere of influence, the mausoleum and the uh, Statue of Liberty work fairly well together. So overall, I do think the mausoleum is probably the best wonder in the era. It's going to be the most competitive most of the time. But we do still have one other wonder, and it is still a good wonder, which is the statue of Zeus. 
The Statue of Zeus gives you plus 10% money per alliance on your empire. It also gives you a plus, a plus 10 stability on the city you have it in. And it acts as a holy site for plus 20 faith and plus 20 stability. So the Statue of Zeus overall is giving you plus 50 stability because of the base stability you get for all wonders, in addition to the money and faith that you're getting, which as core outputs at this point in the game is really powerful. It means you can build five more districts than you would otherwise be able to. And that's a pretty significant increase in the number of districts that your cities can support in the classical era. But that's even before we talk about the plus 10% money per alliance. So the plus 10% money per alliance is going to be really good for people that are pursuing more peaceful games. And in particular, there are two play styles that play into that. The first are merchants, because merchants want to be trading, and which gives them more money. They're already incentivized to be at peace with other cultures in order to continue to get those trading benefits. And this statue encourages you to take that one step farther to move from a trading arrangement into an alliance so that you can modify your already high money output as a merchant and you know really just explode it get a, like two three alliances get that plus 10 plus 20 plus 30 percent money and this can enable you to get a lot more buyouts to reach your era stars and really set you up for later in the game the other one that's a little less obvious is going to be the aesthetes and this is more in single player than in multiplayer in single player the aesthetes have a bonus towards getting the ai to agree to deals which also includes making the AI more willing to enter an alliance with you. So although aesthetes are not going to have the same money generation as a merchant culture, they are going to be able to more reliably get alliances, which means they're more likely to be able to benefit from the plus 10% money per alliance, even if they don't have as high of a money output. And finally, with... Uh, with the holy site bonuses comes the fact that this works well with a religious game, right? You get you get your holy site yield and you get faith and you get a bunch of stability. And honestly, even without the plus 10% money per alliance, it still might be worth building the statue of Zeus if you're pursuing a strong religious game. But that plus 10% money is just the cherry on top. So on the statue of Zeus, you already get a ton of benefits and you're going to get benefits for any tenets that affect holy sites as well. So the Statue of Zeus, if you are pursuing that strong religion game, definitely the best wonder in this era. So let's talk about some of the cultures that this works well with. So the first are going to be the Axumites. And the Axumites are just a really strong merchant culture that can generate a lot of money. And the Axumites are... Um, they're coming at a point in the game where it can be a little bit difficult to generate merchant stars, but they also they have enough capability to generate money that the Statue of Zeus helps support, and the emblematic quarter for the Axumites also provides you with faith, which plays into the religion game for the statue. And the Great Obelisk, their emblematic quarter, also gives you money per number of territories under your religion's influence. So the Axumites are really this money-generating culture that also play into a religious play style. So the Statue of Zeus is really like the perfect uh, combination for the Axumites. You really couldn't ask for anything more. Another obvious one is the... Byzantines, because the Byzantines are getting a bonus for the number of alliances they have anyway. They get plus 5% money per alliance on their empire. So combining with the Statue of Zeus, for every alliance you have, you're getting plus 15% money. So you're increasing the effect of the Statue of Zeus by 50%. Pretty good. <laughs> There's not much more to say about the Byzantines, but... 
the Byzantines, you know, they already have the capability to generate a significant amount of money if they have access to horses. That's going to be modified for every alliance that you have. Next are the Indians, and this is one of the few times I'm going to mention a contemporary era culture. And the reason that I'm mentioning the Indians is because they have this uh, affinity or this trait that gives them plus 10% money per number of territories in your sphere of influence. And then they have an emblematic unit called the Peacekeepers who get bonus combat strength for every war that is declared on the owner. And they are an uh, esthete culture, so they're able to form alliances more easily. So what this means is that as the Indians, you already get a ton of money from having territories in your sphere of influence. And between the peacekeepers and being an esthete, it really discourages enemy players from wanting to attack you. So it makes it more easy to form alliances to get the benefits of the statue of zeus and the statue of zeus that plus 10 percent money is going to continue to modify the insane money generation that you get from your trade so the indians can make a ton a ton of money even without the statue of zeus but the statue of zeus really plays in to the play styles that they're pursuing anyway and then the emblematic quarter the ashram gives you plus one faith per population in addition to some faith per adjacent district so it continues the money and um faith kind of game and that's exactly what you want if you have the statue of zeus next are the dutch and with the dutch it's pretty simple the voc warehouse generates such an insane amount of money like literally even with a few a f three territories you're talking about <laughs> you know uh, over 200 gold in most of your major cities po potentially up to 300 and that's going to depend on your you know the number of territories that you have and the number of harbors that you have and all that kind of stuff but the voc warehouse across your empire is going to be generating you thousands of gold per turn and the statue of zeus even with just a single alliance is going to be making you a ton of money. <laughs> and finally, uh, we come to the Ghanaians, another merchant culture. And the Ghanaians, I would say, are a w bit of a weaker synergy with the Statue of Zeus. They do have that merchant culture affinity, and they do have the ability to generate a fair amount of money with their uh, luxuries market as well as their legacy traits. But it's not quite as strong as the other cultures listed here. But I do think it's still worthwhile talking about because they that plus three money per number of trade routes on the emblematic quarter encourages you to maintain fairly strong relationships with at least some neighbors so you can maintain your trade route benefits. So Statue of Zeus plays in nicely to that. You try to secure some alliances with some of your neighbors, continue to trade with them. So, really, the general strategy on the Statue of Zeus, you form multiple alliances. You want as many as possible. But even just a couple will offer pretty substantial benefit. And it does provide a lot of other benefits as well, just from being a holy site. So even if you never benefit from the plus 10% money the entire game, if you're pursuing a religious strategy, you get a lot of benefits out of the Statue of Zeus. So a couple wonder synergies here. Uh, the first is the Taj Mahal. And the synergy here is kind of twofold. First, the Taj Mahal gives you plus 50% money on your city. So the Statue of Zeus with the plus 10% money per alliance, you can get some insane money outputs. The second part of the synergy is that the Taj Mahal, in order to get that plus 50% money, you have to be above the 90% stability threshold. Well, the Statue of Zeus provides a ton of stability. It gives you plus 50 stability overall. So the Statue of Zeus can help ensure that not only are you getting more money, but that you're also able to reach the stability threshold you need for the Taj Mahal to kick in. 
And the Taj Mahal, you're probably going to have built in a city that's generating a bunch of gold. Maybe you have some traders, maybe you have some market quarters, whatever it is. So the Taj Mahal and Statue of Zeus synergize on everything that they do. The other is going to be, uh, the other obvious one is going to be the Statue of Liberty. Statue of Liberty gives you plus 1% money uh, for the uh, territories that are under your sphere of influence. Obviously, if you have a strong culture game, you have a Statue of Zeus, you have the Statue of Liberty, you'll make a ton of money. <laughs> that's, that's how that works together. It's very simple. And again, like other holy sites, the Statue of Zeus is going to combine well with other holy sites. Uh, just, you know, for the fact that if you're pursuing that religious game, the more holy sites you have, the more benefits you're going to get from stacking up the bonuses from the tenants. So overall, I do like the Statue of Zeus. It's a good wonder. In most situations, I would still place it behind the mausoleum, but it is still well ahead of the Colossus, and in most cases is going to be more useful than the White House. So this concludes the discussion for humankind's classical era wonders. I do hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts if you think there are other synergies I may have missed with cultures or wonders or play styles, or perhaps you found some value in one of the wonders that I didn't discuss. In the meantime, though, keep a lookout for the medieval era wonders that will be coming in the not-too-distant future, and I'll see you next time.